finally have something to celebrate in this great country wherein we live today, although it's, uh, I believe, under attack at this point. Um, this morning, or I think last night, actually, I posted a video on our um, um, church group page. It's an interview with uh, Governor Mike Huckabee. I hope that you'll take some time this afternoon and listen to that uh, that video. I was very uh, encouraged by what he said uh, when he was asked, "What what is wrong with our country? What is happening in our country? And what can we do about it? I, I believe that he gave a good biblical answer as to what we can do about it. Uh, I don't know that it was received that well, but uh, it was truth, and, uh, and I believe in the truth, don't you? Uh, I want to ask you this, this morning to turn your Bibles to uh, two passages. Uh, one is found in Psalm 33, verse 12, and one is found in Proverbs 14, verse number 34. That will be the basis for our message this morning, titled One Nation Under God. I still believe that America is the greatest nation on the face of this planet. Uh, I'm uh, proud to be an American. Uh, my blood is red, white, and blue. I praise the Lord for the freedoms that we enjoy in our country to this very day when old glory is raised um, cold chills go up my back. Um, I I am a patriot and I believe in the principles that our nation was founded upon. At the same time, I'm reminded according to the word of God that my citizenship is in heaven. Uh, I'm actually a part of that kingdom and I represent that kingdom while I'm here on this earth. But my country is important to me and so on this uh, Fourth of July weekend, I wanted to share some insight into why our nation is uh, is under God. And though it doesn't seem to be that way practically today, uh, we need to be reminded where we came from. And as believers, citizens of a country in heaven, uh, we need to be praying for the place where we live right now until Jesus returns or until we go to that everlasting country. But Proverbs 14, verse 34, is a key verse that I want to dwell upon this morning. Proverbs 14, verse 34, it says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, what, that's what the Bible says. The Word of God says that it's righteousness that will build up, exalt a nation. The righteousness will make a nation profitable. Righteousness will make a, a, a nation honorable. Righteousness will sustain a nation. And then in Psalm 33, verse number 12, we read, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, And the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Blessed. The word blessed can mean happy. Oh, so happy. Are you happy with your nation today? Can you say that you're happy with what's going on in in our nation today? Why? Well, according to that passage, a nation whose God is the Lord, whose God is Yahweh, is a happy nation. And the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. So this morning I want to begin by reviewing how blessed we are as a country. Reviewing America's blessings. The Bible says righteousness exalts a nation. What does righteousness refer to? What does it mean? Well, the definition that I've always shared here, the, the being and the doing of that which is right, or it's translated as people living by just and godly principles that produce just and godly actions. Righteousness, the being and the doing of right. Of course, God is righteous, is He not? And so being like God is being righteous. 
Uh, and it says the word, the righteousness exalts. It literally means in the Hebrew language, raises to honor. The word exalts means to lift up, used here in a very moral sense. It literally means that when a nation is righteous nation, then that nation will be honored among many and lifted up before all. So how does an individual or a nation become righteous? Understand three principles regarding righteousness. First of all, we are not righteous by nature. In fact, by nature, we are sinners. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're not righteous by nature. Um, I don't believe in the concept that everyone has a little spark of good in them. No, the Word of God says that we are uh, sinners by nature. We're born with a natural drive to do wrong. Uh, we do not become righteous by being good. Because the Scripture teaches that all of our righteousness, all of our man-produced righteousness is this filthy rags. It's filthy rags when it's compared to God's holiness. So we cannot make ourselves righteous by being good. We cannot, cannot enact new laws and new principles that, that govern sinful people. Because doing good doesn't make you righteous. We are only made righteous through Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible teaches that's what God says. The only way that you can be righteous is be like me. And the only way that sinful people like you and me can be like God is through Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says this, For he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Did you read that? God made Jesus to be sin. In, in, in the original language, the word to be is not there. God made Jesus sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So the only way a person or a nation can be righteous is through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our forefathers understood righteousness they knew what it meant they knew that righteousness was the catalyst to give birth to this nation of people looking for freedom and liberty they knew that just as christ paid the price for our liberty they too would have to pay a price for liberty liberty and freedom have always come with a price our nation was first settled by people who came to these shores looking to live out their faith. That's the purpose they came. They weren't trying to get away from something. They were trying to find something. They were looking for the freedom to worship God. You all are familiar, of course, with the pilgrims who came uh, and landed on Plymouth Rock on the Mayflower. Just as they landed, they joined together in what they called the Mayflower Compact in 1620. I want you to listen to the words of the Mayflower Compact. This is what our founders said. In the name of God, amen. Having undertaken for the glory of God and for the advancement of the Christian faith, do solemnly and mutually in the presence of God covenant and combine ourselves together. Those settlers wrote, We came here for the glory of God and for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about that. Let that sink in. That's what the founders of our country said. That's why they came. That was their purpose. In 1643, just about 23 years later, as more and more people came to the shores and up to New England, they formed a confederation that was called the New England Confederation. This was the first written constitution of groups meeting together in 1643. 
the New England Confederation Constitution began like this. Whereas we all came into these parts with one and the same end and aim, namely the advance, the, uh, to advance the kingdom of, of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel in purity and peace. Friends, America was founded by men and women who acknowledged God's supreme rule over our lives. They were looking for His righteousness to exalt this nation. And I believe that it has. I believe that we are a most exalted country because, at least in the past, God has been the foundation of our country. It was based on Judeo Judeo-Christian principles that to this day are enacted in laws. Why is it unlawful, tell me, to murder someone in America today? It's unlawful because the Word of God says, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder. The laws that our foundation is based upon come from the Word of God, the Scriptures. The innocent are protected in the Scriptures, and they're protected today by laws. And yet what is happening all around our country today is an attempt to take down our laws. Take a moment and read again the Declaration of Independence that was signed on July 4th, 1776. I'm convinced that there are many young people today who could not tell you the date that it was signed. Most of you are familiar with the prologue that says this, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, all men, all men, all men, are created equal and are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, they didn't say happiness. It said the pursuit of happiness. The Constitution did not say that you have a right to be happy. It says you have a right to pursue happiness. Because these founders were very wise. They acknowledged in their treatise that these rights, life, liberty, and pursuing happiness, came from our Creator. They came from God. They do not come from human government. It comes from God and they acknowledged it and that's why they said it. In the next line they said this, and that to secure or protect these rights, governments are instituted among men. What they're saying is we want the form of government whose job it is to protect and to guard what the Creator has given to each and every one of us. You may have seen the painting of the First Continental Congress. And many of you have heard the story of how they were discussing and how they were debating about how the Declaration of Independence would be written. And finally, Ben Franklin stood up and he said, Gentlemen, if it is true that not one single petal from any flower falls to the ground without escaping God's attention, will the distress of this nation go unheeded? Let us therefore determine to seek His face. And at that suggestion, 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence all went to their knees as one man and began to pray and seek for the wisdom of God. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing today if our Congress would go to their knees in prayer? Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing today if the Ninth Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and every other court, including the Supreme Court, would just get on their knees like the forefathers did and say, Almighty God, what do you want this nation to do? In November, if we're still here, if there still is a government, we're going to have a wonderful opportunity to act upon what we believe and voice our desire for righteousness in our nation by voting. 
It's the last freedom that we have. The ability to express our desire as a people to those who supposedly represent us that we want righteousness again. Righteousness exalts a nation. I want you to listen to the voice this morning of our founding fathers. They were not perfect. They were human, just like you are not perfect. But I want you to listen to what they said. John Quincy Adams, who would become president, said later in 1821 about the Declaration of Independence, from the time of the De Declaration of Independence, the American people were bound by the laws of God and the laws of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which they are acknowledged as the root of their conduct. We all came together to obey the word of God. George Washington, you know how that, who that is, right? His farewell address to the nation. This is what he said. The first president. Do not let anyone claim tribute of American patriotism if they even attempt to remove religion from politics. That's what Washington said. Patrick Henry. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Patrick Henry said. Listen to what President Thomas Jefferson said in his address to Danbury Baptist. He said the First Amendment has created a wall of separation between church and state, but that wall is a one-directional wall. It keeps the government from running the church, but it makes sure that Christian principles will always stay in government. That's what the First Amendment says. It says that the government can't have any authority over the church. It doesn't say that the church doesn't have a voice in the government. So think about where we came from. Americans, American Christians. Our nation was founded upon the truth of God's Word. The purpose the people that came here the first time came was to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. The same gospel that saves our souls. The same gospel that you and I are supposed to be sharing today. And I'm convinced the same gospel that is the only cure for our world today. We've come a long way from then, haven't we? So the second thing I want to call your attention to this morning is the fact that we need to repent of America's indifference. There needs to be a repentance in our nation. Repentance to God. Not apologies to each other, but repentance to God. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 34b, but sin is a reproach to any people. But sin among the nation's people is a reproach. It has a very destructive effect it's a disgrace. That's what the word reproach means. And the word is only used here and one other time in the Old Testament. Leviticus 20 verse 17. There it refers to a family member who reveals the nakedness of another member of the family. Sin. What does it mean? Sin means missing the mark. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark of perfection. We've all missed the mark of holiness. We are not like God at all. Sin in practical understanding means anything that we do, think, or say that is not righteous according to God's holy standard as revealed in His Word. Anything that we say, think, or do, and I might just add, anything we fail to do that we're supposed to do for the Lord is considered sin in God's eyes. And if that's truly the definition, then everybody in this room today is guilty. <laughs> and there's a need for repentance of our sin, not only as a nation, but as individuals, because a nation is made up of individuals, is it not? 
Sin is beyond our ability to cure on our own. It, it will always find you out. It always leads to reproach or disgrace. Compare Proverbs 13, verse number 6. It says, Righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way, but wickedness overthroweth the sinner. So let's do some review as to where our nation has fallen from righteousness. Um, you know, we did not have a pledge, a pledge to our flag, uh, until a man by the name of Francis Bellamy who was uh, on the magazine staff for a boys and girls periodical that was entitled The Youth Companions and drew, introduced uh, that pledge idea in 1890. It was then that President Benjamin Harrison who proclaimed the first use of the original plague, plague pledge on October 12, 1892 during Columbus Day observance in public schools. Isn't that amazing? Today they're trying to change Columbus Day to take it away. But on that day, Harrison said, I pledge allegiance to my flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That was the original pledge. The words, my flag, were changed later to the flag of the United States of America by an amendment adopted on Flag Day, June 14, 1924. Then in 1954, the Congress of the United States jointly amended the pledge with the words, under God. President Dwight Eisenhower said as he signed this amendment, this shows the transcendence of religious faith in America's heritage and her future. It was finally spoken as our pledge of allegiance for the first time on June 14, 1954, Flag Day, on the steps of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It has remained as our nation's pledge up until the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals tried to rule it unconstitutional because of the phrase, under God. Should we really be surprised? For it was less than a decade after our own government added that phrase, under God, that some Americans began to do everything legally within the power of their power to remove God's presence and God's character from this nation. In 1963, the Supreme Court first took out prayer in schools. The next ruling removed the Bible readings from our classrooms. Then they took the Ten Commandments off the walls of all schools and public buildings. Later, it was a rule that students cannot pray at graduation. Next, the godless of our society will challenge our money, our prayers that opened the Supreme Court and the House and the Senate, and within a matter of time, we will have regressed to the undeniable reality, sin is a reproach to any people. So what do we do about it? Enact a new law? Pray that our president is reelected so everything will be better? No. He can't change that. See, the problem, as I was reminded in my quiet time this morning, is not the external things around us. It's not the environment. The problem with men is their heart. That's the problem we have in our world today. It's a heart problem. And until the heart is changed, until the heart is driven to Jesus... It will just get worse. So what must we do? We must reclaim America's inspiration. We must continue to preach this message over and over and over. Not just from the pulpits, but, but out in the community. 
in the workplace, wherever we live, we must stand up for what we believe is true from the Word of God, even though it may be politically incorrect. Maybe you know, we'll receive persecution because of it. We must be brave and courageous like our forefathers were to preach the message of the Gospel. For it alone changes the hearts of people. Psalm 33, 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I want to ask you this morning, who's your God? Or maybe I should rephrase, what is your God? You see, your God is anything that you worship. Anything that you put before everything else, that's your God. Blessed is the nation, it says, whose God is is Wall Street. No. Whose God is the Lord. The people he chose for his inheritance. Blessed is the nation. The idea here is that the nation referred to is happy. Happy is a nation. Content is a nation. What is true of a nation is also true of an individual whose God is the Lord, whose God is Yahweh. For so this is in the original Hebrew. It reads like this, the nation which worships Yahweh is under His protection. They're blessed. They're happy. They're content. How can we reclaim the inspiration and the power of God that was so obviously directing the people that brought this country together. The answer lies in those who are in this room right now. You know, those who are listening by way of live stream this morning. If you claim to be a man or a woman of God, you must act on your faith. You must live in righteousness like Christ was righteous. What can you do? Well, first of all, you can personally repent of sin that may be in your life. Sin that you're committing in your life. Repent of that sin. Turn from it. Ask God to forgive you for your sin. And He will. He promises He will. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Revival has to begin in the house of God. It begins with God's people that we might get our hearts right before Him. And secondly, if you're a Christian, you need to quit riding the fence post. Choose you this day who you'll serve. And then friends, I compel you this morning to get on your knees and pray. Pray for this world. Pray for this nation. Pray against the division. Pray for unity. Pray that we will find unity surrounded, uh, 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 the, uh, surrounding these principles. You can insist that we not allow a liberal atheistic minority to rob us of our spiritual heritage. You can live your life in a manner that reflects your trust in our living God. You're not depending upon the government. You're not depending on trusting on the government to save you. If you are, you're going to be disappointed. Trust the Lord to save you. And then, again, you can vote for righteousness on every level. Vote for what is righteous. Don't cast your very important vote for someone who believes in things that are anti-God, anti-biblical. A generation ago, another great American was standing for freedom and for righteousness. His name was Dr. Martin Luther King. And he gave a most memorable address that is played every year. I have a dream. You can see a man who had a heart for God and a heart for people in that address. Not so long ago, there was a pastor named Larry Thompson who wrote, I too have a dream. I wanted to read that for you this morning as I conclude. I too have a dream that those who claim to be children of God, redeemed by Christ, will declare their faith without fear or shame, 
and live a life that matches their profession. I too have a dream that America will one day realize that we cannot change man by simply changing his environment, but understanding that it is a work of God in man's heart that affects an eternal change in man's life. I too have a dream, he said, that the people of God would destroy the walls men have created to divide us, and join hands and hearts to show the unified power and love that is ours as followers of Jesus Christ. I too have a dream that one day in our great nation, there will be such a spiritual renewal and awakening that we won't have to worry about prayer in our schools because the witness in our homes will produce godly young men and women that will impact their schools our neighborhoods, our cities, our states, and our nation with His righteousness. I too have a dream that one day America will repent of our national sin of killing the unborn child. I too have a dream that revival will spread across this land reaching into every community so that the light of the Lord will be seen from America and His light will go into all the world. I too have a dream that the men and women who aspire to serve this nation would run for office from a conviction that as God has made a difference in their lives, they can now serve the people in moral purity, truth, conviction, and righteousness. I too have a dream that our families would be restored and protected, and that we will seek to strengthen our homes with godly men who are filled with God's Spirit, who, who understand their role as spiritual leaders. I, too, have a dream that the church, God's church in America, will once again rise up, awake from their slumber, and become the moral and spiritual voice of the community where people will look for comfort inspiration, direction, and moral leadership. I, too, have a dream that the churches of America will be filled once again and that there will be a great hunger for God's Word that will increase across the land. I, too, have a dream that America will return to the faith of our founding fathers. I, too, have a dream. A dream that this world will once again say of these United States of America, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you today for the privilege that we have to be part of this great nation. It's anything but perfect. It had a wonderful beginning. I pray that we might remember why we're here. And Father, that we might be diligent to live a life of righteousness before those around us. And we might continue to be faithful in spreading the good news of the gospel because it alone can change the hearts of people. I pray that, Father, you might give us a love and concern for others. I pray today that you might bless our country if you can. See fit, Lord, to raise us up again. I pray against all the division in our world today. I pray for wisdom for those who are leaders in our country. Give them great wisdom from you, and I pray they might make decisions that reflect your righteousness. Help us as citizens to do our part to be law keepers, not law breakers. To lift up those who are in authority over us because you've said in your word that you've ordained all authority. Even though we may not agree with some, I pray we might be faithful to honor the position that you've given them. Help us, Lord, to find ways during this pandemic and during these uh, divisive times to Uh, seek opportunity to share good news. There's so much bad news around us. 
Help us to share the good news of the gospel. Help us, Lord, to allow the Spirit of God to seek and to, to search our hearts and to show, show us sin that we need to confess and forsake and repent of. And forgive us, Lord, of the sin of taking for granted the freedoms that we have in this country. Thank you, God, for those men and women who paid the ultimate price so that we might still have freedoms as Americans. Help us to honor their sacrifice. And as citizens of another country, representatives of heaven, I pray that, Father, we might represent you well in this world. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Lord bless you, folks. We'll see you Wednesday.